Last time we completed building our evaluator, and as you saw, we slightly misled you. We started off saying we were going to use Scheme's lexical analyzer and parser, but then build our own evaluator, which we did initially for arithmetic expressions, then for defines, then for applications, and eventually we ended up with something that basically looked like Scheme's evaluator, written in Scheme. Today, we're going to build on that idea by examining the actual Scheme evaluator. We'll run through a quick but grand tour of the full evaluator looking at several key ideas. First, remember that we are basically describing the process of evaluation, which in our case means making the environment model a concrete set of procedures. Second, the essential message is that by defining the process of evaluation, we are also defining our language. This means that the evaluator design then provides the basis on which we can create abstractions, especially procedural abstractions, as it provides the mechanism for unwinding the abstraction back down to primitive pieces when we want to get an actual value. And finally, given that designing an evaluator is essentially equivalent to designing a language, we're going to look at how variations in a scheme evaluator can lead to very different language behavior. To do this, we're going to have to look at several different parts of the language design. We'll start with the core of eval and apply, then look at how we support the syntax of the language, how we create and manipulate the environments that let us look up values that are associated with that syntax, and then how primitives are installed into the initial or global environment. Finally, we'll put together the overall infrastructure for letting a user interact with the evaluator. And we'll see all of these pieces as we walk quickly through our full evaluator. As with previous lectures, there's a code handout that goes with this lecture, and we suggest you print out a copy or have one available as we walk through all of this in order to follow along. Let's start with the heart of the interpreter. We've already seen this with our simple interpreter from last time. The essence of the evaluator is a tight loop in which the evaluation of an expression with respect to an environment reduces, in the general case, to the application of a procedure object to a set of arguments. And this, in turn, generally reduces to the evaluation of a simpler expression, namely the body of the procedure, with respect to a new environment, one in which the formal parameters have been bound to a new set of arguments. This loop continues unwinding expressions until it reaches the application of a primitive procedure or the evaluation of a primitive data object. Our convention in setting this up is we'll use an eval that does dispatch on type. That is, it checks the expression type, and based on that, sends the expression off to a particular procedure to handle that kind of expression. Our convention on apply is that it will first evaluate the arguments, then apply the procedure that is the value of the first argument to the values of the others. So here's our implementation of eval. As we said, this is also on a printout that you can do separately, so you can have it around as we walk through all of this. We're just going to capture pieces here as part of the lecture. Check out the form of eval. First of all, it's a dispatch on type. So it checks the expression to figure out what kind of beast it is, then sends it to the procedure that handles evaluation for such beasts. Also notice that we're assuming a data abstraction for checking out types. We're not making any particular assumptions, but we're using a set of procedures to check each type. This will mean that we can always cleanly add or alter our types later on and not have to change anything in terms of the evaluation itself. Also, notice the order in which we check things in eval. We first start out by checking for primitives, things like a self-evaluating expression or a variable. These are easy things to deal with. Next, we check out the special forms. And remember, a special form means something that does not obey the normal rules of evaluation. These are clearly things like assignment or definition, in which we only want to evaluate one of the sub-expressions, but not both, or things like if, where we know we want to evaluate in a different order. Each one of these will treat separately with a specific procedure to deal with the kind of expression shown here. We've added a couple of new ones, and we'll come back to those in a second. The flavor to see, though, is that we've now dealt with all of the special forms. And then finally, we get to an application. That is, we get to the case where we're treating an expression which has a set of sub-expressions, each of which we're going to evaluate, and then apply the operator, that's the value of the first sub-expression, to all the rest of them. We've left application question mark as an abstraction here to check to see whether something's an application. But as you saw with our earlier examples of evals, most likely we'll just try and make sure this is a combination, meaning we will s assume that if it's not something that's a primitive and it's not something that's a special form, by definition we'll expect it to actually be an application. In general, however, we see that our evaluator has exactly the kind of form that we slowly grew up to in our previous lectures. Given an expression and an environment, the eval will check the type of the expression using some abstractions we'll get to for seeing if it's a primitive, then seeing if it's a special form, then ultimately checking to see if it's an application. In each case, it's going to dispatch that expression off to a procedure to handle it. And we've seen many of these things. We know what variable should do. It should just look up the value of the variable in the environment. We know what quoted should do. It should simply grab the quotation and return it. We know what each of the special forms in general should do. Definitions should create a binding for a name and a value in the new environment. Similarly, if should change the order in which we evaluate the expressions, and so on.
And of course, the last thing we do is get to an application in which we evaluate the first sub-expression, the operator, and then get the values of all the other sub-expressions as a list and apply that operator to that list. In fact, notice I misled you slightly because we don't have to say that the operator is the first sub-expression here. Operator is simply some data abstraction that will get out the right piece of the expression, but it could in fact be some other part, as we'll see shortly. So here's a quick synopsis of what we see on that evaluator. The evaluator dispatches on type. The first things it checks are the primitives, things that are self-evaluating or something that's merely quoted. We'll have to implement quoted shortly. We'll come back to it because we haven't seen it before. Second set of things it deals with are variables and the way they're manipulated within the environment. This includes being able to define a variable, being able to look up a value of a variable, and being able to change the value of a variable. The third set of things we've seen are conditionals, ways of branching depending on what the value of an expression is. If we saw in our earlier evaluators, here we've also added in cond, and we'll come back to how we can actually implement that in a second. Then ultimately, we get around to procedure application. How do we apply an operator or a procedure to a set of arguments? We've added one other new thing to our system, by the way, and that's dealing with sequences of expressions, begins. And let's look at that briefly before we come back to looking at procedure application. In the evaluators we built over the last couple of lectures, when we got around to applying a procedure to a set of arguments, we saw that reduced to simply evaluating the body of the procedure with respect to a new environment, one in which the parameters had been bound to the values passed in. But evaluation of the body just reduced to recursively using a val on that expression. And that was because we assumed that the body was just one single expression. In fact, before we introduce mutation into our language, that would make sense, because the value of the body would be the value of the last expression, and that basically said there should only be one expression there. If we had more than one expression, evaluating them in order would simply cause us to throw away things. Once we have mutation, though, expressions can do things other than return values. They can create side effects. And so a generalization for an evaluator is to let the body of a procedure be a sequence of one or more expressions. That's shown here, for example, in which we define foo to be a procedure that has two expressions in its body. One that does something, probably a side effect, since the value returned will simply be lost, and then one that actually computes and returns a value. Now, we still have to figure out how to do evaluation of a sequence. We'll get to that in a second. But given the idea that evaluating a sequence could take a series of expressions in order, evaluate them in order, and then return the value of the last one, we could see that in our generalization now, we could have procedure bodies contain multiple expressions. And inside of our apply, we'll evaluate the sequence of the whole procedure body, not just the body as a single expression. This then says that our apply, our way of dealing with uh, applications of procedures to arguments, will be slightly different. It'll have, again, a way of dealing with primitives, and it'll have a, day a way of dealing with compound procedures, but that one's going to change slightly. Nonetheless, notice the form. Apply of a procedure to a set of arguments first checks to see if it's a primitive procedure, something that's built in, in which case we'll send it off to the thing that deals with that application. If it's a compound procedure, a combination that's using something we built with our own lambda, for example, we will get out a new environment by taking the parameters of the procedure, using the appropriate data abstraction, taking the arguments passed in, and doing a binding of those parameters to those arguments in a frame which extends the environment that was the environment the procedure held. Given this new environment, we will then evaluate the body of the procedure, but notice here we'll evaluate it as a sequence, not as a single eval, meaning we'll treat it as a set of expressions, evaluate each one in order, and return the value of the last one as the value of the overall application. With that, we now see the intertwining of eval and apply. Let's take a look now at some of the specific pieces. So let's quickly look through the pieces of eval, checking out some of the things to make sure they do what we expect. First of all, self-evaluating expressions. Well, remember, EXP is just a tree structure. Self-evaluating says just return the value of that expression, just return that tree structure. So things like numbers will simply be returned as numbers. If an expression is just a variable, a symbol, we'll simply look up that variable in the environment. We'll get to that shortly. Next, let's skip down to procedure application. With our change, we can see that the evaluator gets the value of the operator by recursively evaluating the sub-expression, then gets a list of values of the other expressions. Note that we explicitly require a list here by evaluating this case each speech in turn and constructing up a list of values. Note, however, that our data abstraction isolates the issues of the order of the arguments from our evaluator. We don't know if the operator is the first expression or not in this case. Operator simply will select out whatever we decide to have in terms of our semantics and syntax for our language. And as we saw, apply will now evaluate the sequence of expressions that it assumes the body contains. What about ifs? 
Well, we know what an if should do. It should take a sequence of expressions, evaluate the first sub-expression, or rather we're going to assume it's the first sub-expression, and depending on that value, either evaluate the uh, consequent or the alternative. And if you look in the code that we've handed out, you'll see that this does exactly the right thing. What about begins? Remember, a sequence is something that's either identified by an explicit begin statement or in the body of a procedure, as we just saw. So what we want to do in this case is get out the set of expressions and evaluate them. And we'll do the following trick, which we show in the next slide. Well, to evaluate a sequence, we know what we should do. We should evaluate e each of the expressions in order. When we get to the last one, we should return its value as the value of the overall expression. Again, we're going to bury some things behind some data abstractions, but we can see here the form we'd expect for evaluating a sequence. If it's the last expression, we'll get it out and simply evaluate it by recursively calling a val on all of this. On the other hand, if it's not, we'll evaluate the next sequence or next expression in the sequence, and having done that, we'll move on and evaluate the remaining expressions in the sequence. Expressions like definition and assignment simply either create or change bindings of variables and values in the environment. But notice the form. In both these cases, we get out the part of the expression that corresponds to the new value and actually evaluate it by recursively applying a val to that. We similarly, though, get out just the part of the expression that corresponds to the variable as a tree structure kind of manipulation, grabbing out that piece without evaluation and then doing something in the environment. Again, notice, by using data abstractions here, we have not specified what order the expressions will be in. We need to do that ultimately, but here, a change in the order will not change how these evaluations take place. So there's the whirlwind tour of a val and apply. We've certainly buried some details behind some data structures. We're going to come back to that shortly. But the heart that you see here really is the heart of a val. What does a val in general do? Given an expression and environment, in general, it reduces the evaluation of that expression with respect to that environment to the application of a procedure to a set of arguments. And a apply takes that application and in general reduces it to the evaluation of a new expression, the body of the procedure, with respect to a new environment, one in which the parameters have been bound to the arguments passed in while inheriting things from the earlier environment. We have some special forms in between to deal with other kinds of things, but that's the general form of a val and apply. You ought to be able to look at the code we've just handed out and see how all of this is taking place. Now let's think about what we've done. Basically, we've defined the semantics of our language. By defining a val and apply, we've specified what the language means and the model of computation we're going to use. Notice as well, though, we've done this in terms of data abstractions. Everything we've used to pull out list structure from the expressions has used an abstraction. There are no cars and coders anywhere in there. This is actually valuable for us because we've separated out the syntax from the semantics. We said, given that these particular subpieces have meaning, we'll do something with them. Ultimately, though, we also have to specify the syntax for the language, the particulars of how we write expressions. And that's going to enable us, for example, to determine when we have different kinds of expressions, which ones are special forms, and how to deal with them. At the same time, this separation of syntax and semantics is extremely useful. It allows us to very easily change the syntax without having to do anything to a valid and apply. We're simply changing the interface to the abstractions. So we're going to look at that, both by showing a little bit about how we built the syntax for our language, and then how we can easily change it. The second page of the code handout contains all of this in much more detail. We're just going to highlight here some of the key things to look at in terms of how we define our basic syntax. Let's start with the first part. We need a set of routines to detect different kinds of expressions. And an easy way to do that is to have each one of them check to see if it's a tagged list. So for example, if question mark, we'll check to see if the expression is a list, that is, it's something that's constructed out of pairs, and we'll then check to see if the first element of that list is the symbol if. Ditto for lambda. Application, we're going to use as we did before. We're going to assume that anything that has not been caught by a special flag, a special keyword, but is in fact a combination of expressions, or a list if you like, we're going to treat as an application. This means that we may get into some trouble, but it's the easiest way of allowing us to generalize to having any kind of procedure applied to any kind of set of expressions, as long as that procedure was created using our lambda. Given that we can detect different kinds of expressions and ship them off to the procedure that handles them, those procedures will also need to have ways of getting information out of the expressions. They'll have to have ways of pulling out the pieces by walking down the list structure. So for example, if it's an application, we need to have a way of getting out the operator and the other expressions. Here, we're going to assume that the first sub-expression is in fact the operator, so car will grab it. And we'll assume that operands is a list of all the remaining things, so coulder would grab that. Of course, he might have made a different choice, as we'll see. The key point is that we now have an abstraction that pulls out pieces to pass on to the evaluator. 
and we'll need to have routines that manipulate the expressions, that is, walk along them getting out the pieces. For example, if we're applying a procedure to a set of uh, arguments, we need to be able to get out the different parts of the operands. So we'll have to have something that both checks to see, are there any here, as well as one that gets either out the first or the remaining operands. Again, this is now list structure, and again, we're making a choice about order. We're assuming that the operands are, for example, in this case, in a left to right order. Nonetheless, the overall point is, if you look at the code from page two, what we have in terms of syntax is a set of expressions to deal with the list structure that is passed in both walking down it to find out what kind of expression it is, walking down it to pull out particular pieces, or walking down it to do other manipulations of that list structure. The rest of the code on page two of the handout just fills out the rest of that sort of syntactical definition, how to represent expressions. You ought to look at it to make sure you're comfortable with it, but you should see that it has much the same form, using tag list checking to determine what kind of expression it is, and then using car and quarter operations to get out the pieces that correspond to the different parts of the expression. As we said earlier, one of the reasons for using data abstractions everywhere within eval is to let us separate out the syntax from the semantics. Eval and apply define the semantics, how expressions get their values in this language. The syntax tells us how to write legal expressions. By doing that separation, we can make changes to the syntax without affecting the semantics. And here's one example. Suppose I decide, rather than having the convention that the operator is the first sub-expression and the operands are all the remaining expressions, that I'd like to be much more verbose, much more careful. I might want to have expressions that say, call this procedure on arguments of this form, like call plus args 2, 3, 5, whatever. How would I make this change? How would I allow this kind of more verbose syntax in my language? Well, we've already hinted at the answer. All we need to do is change the syntax. So for example, now, when we want to look at an application, checking to see if it's an application would be something that checks to see if a tagged list has the symbol call at the beginning. Notice that's now different. Before, we just assumed anything that wasn't a special form but was a combination was an application. Here, we're very, being very explicit about identifying things that are actually applications. Now, how do I get out the pieces? Well, remember before, we would have gotten the operator as the first sub-expression. Here, it's the second sub-expression. We know the first sub-expression is the symbol call, so we have to go down one more to get the catter to pull out the thing that's going to be the operator. And for the operands, well, we have to skip down past call, the procedure, and the symbol args to get the remainder of those things. So the change here is in how we pull out the pieces. Otherwise, everything is as before. Again, the key point, all I've changed is the syntax, the routines that walk down the list structure and pull out the pieces. Nothing has changed in eval or apply itself. The second reason for separating syntax from semantics is that it allows us to easily accommodate alternative forms for expressions. We often call this syntactic sugar, meaning that it looks nicer, but it actually just coats the same underlying idea with a sweeter way of expressing it. Let me show you an example. Remember let? We could treat this as a special form and write a handler for it. We could have something that dispatches off based on having detected that this first expression is the keyword let. But we can also realize that let is just a cleaner way of creating a procedure than applying it to capture some local state variables. Or said another way, a let expression is really just the same as the expression shown below. That is, we have a lambda where the argument list for the lambda is the arguments that we're going to have as bindings in the let. The body of the lambda is the body of the let expression itself. And that whole lambda would then be applied to the values that we want to bind to those names. These are, as we saw earlier, equivalent forms. And we've seen in the environment model, they create exactly the same kind of structure. So rather than building a special form and inserting that into la the eval to deal with it, let's see how we can simply use syntax and syntactical manipulation to convert this particular form of a let into the application of a procedure to a set of arguments. First, here's the change we'll make inside of an eval. We'll have something that detects lets. We have to deal with them because we know we have to do something particular to them. But what we're going to do is write something that manipulates the syntax, turns a let into a combination, and then simply evaluates that. So recursively calls a val treating this now as a normal expression. Therefore, we're going to dispatch, but the dispatch is an odd thing. It doesn't dispatch to a procedure that does evaluation. It has syntax being manipulated and then doing eval on the overall thing. So now all we need to do is figure out how to rewrite the uh, tree structure that represents a let expression into something that looks like a procedure application. Well, here we go. First of all, we'll have to have a way of checking do we have a let. And that's just a tag list check as before. What else do we need to do? 
Well, remember, we need to pull out the variables of the let, we need to pull out the values that those variables will be bound to, and we need to pull out the body. So, we do exactly that. Notice, let bound variables, taking in one of these tree structures, is going to get the catter of the expression, that is, everything that corresponds to all the pieces but what we want, and it's going to map car down all of that. We'll check it in a second, but we'll see that that is actually going to pull out the bound variables. Getting the values maps catter down the same structure. And then the body, well, we simply take the coditor of the body to get out the right piece, and we convert that into a single expression, that is, wrap a sequence around it in order to convert it into something that has a begin at the beginning. Ignoring for the moment the specific details, what these three expressions are doing are walking through the tree structure corresponding to a lead expression and pulling out the appropriate pieces, the list of variables, the list of values, and the body, and converting that body into something that actually looks like a sequence. Now we can put all of this together. Let combination, remember, is going to take in one of these tree structures representing a let, and it's going to convert it into a form that we can just evaluate. We're going to pass this off to a val. What does it do? It gets a hold of the tree structure corresponding to the variables. It gets a hold of the tree structure corresponding to the values. It gets a hold of the body. And then it creates, now, a new structure. And notice this structure. The first part of this list, because we're doing a cons, is a list that represents the way we're dealing with procedures. It is open paren lambda followed by a list of names followed by a body. Aha! So that's going to look exactly like a lambda expression. And then what has that done? We've put that on front of or at the beginning of the list of values. So this will convert a let combination into a new tree structure, a tree structure that looks exactly like an application of a lambda to a set of values. That will then be passed to a val, which will cause the evaluation of the whole ex lambda expression, creating the thing we want. Okay, let's trace this through to make sure we understand what's going on. So remember, if we have a let expression, such as the one shown at the top of this slide, the parser converts that into a tree structure that looks exactly like this. The first part of the tree structure is the symbol let. The second part is itself a tree structure. Notice it just mimics the structure we'd expect to see. And then the last part is another piece of tree structure that is the expression that's the body of this let. This tree structure is what's passed into a val. And let's see what happens when we get to it. Now, what does the syntactic manipulation that converts a let expression into a combination do? Well, remember, it's going to first take the thing that grabs the bound variables. And in particular, what did that say to do? It said grab the catter of this expression. So it's going to grab this piece. And then it says walk down this piece, this list structure, and we're using a map, and in particular map car down this list structure. And what does that do? For each element of this list, it takes the car of that structure, which means it's going to grab off and create a new list structure, this one. The next thing it does is takes that same catter, that same list structure, but now maps a different thing down it. In particular, it maps catter down this list. That each means for each element of this list, it applies catter and pulls out those pieces, which is going to build this structure. And then this syntactic manipulation procedure walks down that let tree structure and grabs out the body, giving us this structure. Note what we've done we've constructed three new pieces of list structure. We've done no evaluation here. We've simply manipulated pieces of the tree structure. And given those pieces of tree structure, we now glue them together. And what does the let to combination syntactic manipulation say to do? It says, create a list with the symbol lambda, followed by the set of names, followed by the body. Take that whole piece and then put it on the front of what we have in terms of the values. So what have we done? We've constructed a new set of tree structure, list structure, that represents an expression. Ah, check out its form. It is a list whose first sub-expression is a lambda of the appropriate form, followed by the rest of the list being a set of expressions. And in fact, what we return then is the pointer to this entire tree structure. Here's the structure that gets glued together that gives us out the thing we want to do. We're going to apply that lambda to a set of arguments, or rather we're going to evaluate this whole expression, which is going to turn into an application exactly as we'd expect. So the key point is we can now do syntactic manipulation of expressions to convert one form into another form. In this case, converting a let into its underlying lambda application, and then let a val do the right thing to implement, in fact, the behavior that we want for let. What other syntactic variations can we have? Well, remember that we can have named procedures. That is, we can have forms as a, such as the one shown here. The earlier way of doing it was to say, define foo to be open paren lambda of params and a bunch of stuff. 
as a way of separating out the lambda that created the procedure from the define that actually gave the name to it. But we saw it was convenient, especially when thinking about the substitution model, to have this alternative form in which we clearly identified the application of the procedure to its parameters by using open paren foo and a set of parameters inside of the define. What should we do in order to have this form added to our system? Note so far, evaluator won't deal with this. Well, there are two pieces. In terms of semantics, this is just another define. Everything looks just as before. We're defining a variable to be a particular value. Now, what else would we need to make it happen? Well, as noted, we don't want to change the semantics. The defines are still the same. In fact, that eval definition is exactly what we had before. All we're going to do now is change the syntax, that is, the thing that manipulates the tree structure, to decide how to deal with these two different kinds of expressions. And here's the change. Remember before, getting the value out of a definition would have simply grabbed the third sub-expression. But now, we can be careful. What we'll do is first check to see, is the second sub-expression a symbol? If it is, then we know we have the form define some symbol, some expression. And as before, we'll get out that other expression and return it as the actual value. On the other hand, if it's not a symbol, then we can assume we have one of these new forms. And how, what, now what do we do? Well, in this case, we have to unsugar, unwrap that lambda. So we'll do the following. We'll construct a new lambda using a make lambda procedure that obviously just glues a lambda onto the front of this. And what do we have to pull out? We need to get the formal parameters, and we can walk down the tree structure to grab those. And we need to get the body, and we can walk down the tree structure to grab that. So in this case, getting out the value of the definition will in fact convert this form into a lambda. And that's great because that then gets passed back into a val definition. That will be evaluated, and that means that we will actually get out the lambda, create the procedure, and return that as the value to be bound to the variable itself. So once again, notice that definition value, as in our case of let, is simply manipulating the tree structure to convert one kind of expression into another using our definitions and our conventions for that structure. And then we're evaluating it to do the right thing. In summary then, we have looked at how to build the eval and apply, building on top of the things we did in the previous lectures. We've created that structure which defines the semantics for our language. And now we've separately done the syntax, worked out how to actually manipulate the legal ways of creating expressions. And by building this data abstraction between eval and apply on the one hand and the manipulation of the expressions on the other, we've left ourselves a nice clean way in which we can change syntax, we can add to syntax, we can create procedures that manipulate syntax to convert some kinds of expressions into others without ever having to change eval and apply. So with those two pieces in place, we now have an, an understanding of the uh, semantics of the language and an understanding of the syntax of the language. So you can see we're making pretty good progress on building an actual complete evaluator for Scheme. We started out building eval and apply, doing it on top of some data abstraction so we can see the flow of, of evaluation, how we go back and forth between evaluating an expression with respect to an environment and converting that into an application of a procedure to a set of arguments and back. The second thing we've done is we've now gone in and filled in the details. We've separated out the semantics, which is eval and apply, from the syntax, namely how we actually write expressions. And those data abstractions made that possible for us. Now we have to think about what else do we need to fill in in order to really make sure that everything we do is done in terms of basic concrete terms. And the third thing we have to get to is the environment itself. So far, we've just relied on there being some kind of abstract table for dealing with storing away bindings of variables and values and getting them back out. But now we can actually make that also very explicit. So what do we need in an environment? Well, abstractly, we want to just build the environment diagrams that we had in our environment model. That is, we need a way of taking bindings, pairings of names and values, and gluing them together into tables, where those tables can themselves have pointers to other tables. Remember, a frame is going to inherit from some other environment. So we need to glue things together as sequences of tables, and the tables have to have comparisons or bindings of values and variables together. Well, you could probably already guess that we can just do this using list structure. And indeed, if you look at page three of the code handout, you'll see how we go about representing environments. An environment will just create as a list of frames. So when our little example here, E2, would point to a pair whose first pointer, or car pointer, points to a frame, and whose coder points off to the enclosing environment. And we can obviously just continue to have this list, ending up with the global environment as the last element of this list. To represent a frame, we've got lots of choices. Remember that abstractly what has to go into here is a collection of variables and values paired up. And we could just glue them together in that order. Variable, valuable, variable, value, variable, value. 
Another way to do it, though, is simply to create as a frame two lists. So, in fact, that's how we'll do it if you look at the code. A frame here will be a cons of two things. The first thing will be a list of the variables, and the second thing will be a list of the values. And the correspondence is simply done by walking down the lists in order. The first variable in the list corresponds to the first value in its list, and so on. As we've seen, one of the standard, in fact, the most integral loop of a val and apply is to reduce evaluation of one expression with respect to some environment, ultimately to evaluation of another expression, typically the body of a procedure, with respect to a new environment that extends the original environment. So one of the things we need to be able to do is to, in fact, extend an environment to allow for this new evaluation. How do we do that? Well, abstractly, we know the behavior we want. Extending an environment should take in as input a list of variables, a list of corresponding values, and a current environment. And it should create a new frame that is enclosed or scoped by that original environment in which the list of parameters are bound to the corresponding list of variables. This is just our environment model of creating a new frame and inheriting an environment that creates, as a consequence, a sequence of frames. In terms of our concrete implementation, we can also make this go. Remember, our environment was simply a list of frames. So to extend an environment, we simply want to put on the front of that list a new frame. So if you look at the code, again, on page 3 of the handout, you'll see that extending an environment says put a new frame on the beginning of the current environment. Literally, cons a new frame onto there. And what's that frame do? Well, that frame basically constructs together one of these pairings of a list of values and a list of variables, being careful in this case to make sure that we have the right numbers to match up. So you can see in our concrete implementation, extending an environment simply says create one of these frame structures as a pairing of two lists and put it on the front of the current list of frames, now starting with that point as the environment in which we're going to do evaluation. So once we have an implementation, a concrete way of building environments, we need to use them. In particular, environments are there to help us look up values of variables. So we need to figure out how to write a procedure or set of procedures that will let us do that. In particular, what do we do when we want to look up a variable in an environment? Well, the first thing we know we want to do hierarchically is look for it in a frame. So we'll take a frame, the current frame, and loop through the list of variables and the list of values in parallel. Remember, we stored those as two separate lists, so we simply walk down them in synchrony. If we find the variable we're looking for, then we return that value associated with it. If we get all the way through that pair of lists and do not find the variable, then we know that there's not a binding for this variable in this frame. And what do we do? We move on to the next enclosing environment. And we know that this is just going to be a manipulation of list structure because that's the way we've represented it. So on the next slide, let's look at the piece of code that'll do this for us. So to implement this idea in our particular structure, we just need two different looping mechanisms. The first one, when we're going to look up a variable value, is to have something that loops over environments. So notice what env loop does. It takes in an environment. If it's the empty environment, it complains, saying I can't find it, so it's an unbound variable. Otherwise, it's going to look in the first frame in that environment. And first frame, of course, is just going to grab the first element of that list. If that doesn't work, we're going to expect it to work its way down to the next frame, and we'll see that. But environment loop basically walks its way down the environment, looking for a binding in each frame. And notice what environment loop does. Having gotten the first frame out of this environment, just grabbing that first element of the list, it then runs another loop called scan that takes the frame variables, which remember is a list, and the frame values, which remember is also a list. Again, just walking down and grabbing those two pieces of the list structure. And what does scan do? It basically walks down the two lists in unison. If I run out of variables, I must not have found a binding. I'll go on to the next frame. Notice that it calls environment loop again, going back up to the top level loop with the enclosing environment, which we know means jump past the first frame and grab the remaining environments as a list. If, in fact, though, we still have variables to check, then we look and see, is the next variable on my list the one I'm looking for? If it is, I return the next element on the values list. If it isn't, then I scan again, moving in synchrony down both the variables list and the values list to the next one down. And there's our two loops that let us look up the value of a variable, both within a frame, and if it's not bound there, then in the next frame in the list. Of course, other aspects of manipulating variables in environments, for example, setting a variable value, will have a very similar structure. Just like we can look up a variable, you can see if you look at the code that setting a variable will do the same kind of thing, looking to find the binding and then changing it, doing some mutation. And if, of course, it doesn't find one, it complains and returns an error message. Other than that, we now see how we can build environments just out of list structure, using that to represent the pairings of names or symbols and values in that particular structure organization. To get things going, we need an initial environment, also called the global environment. 
This will be our default environment. This is where we will normally evaluate expressions, at least initially. And therefore, within this environment, we need bindings for the built-in names for things. This will also be our backstop, meaning if we look through all the environments for a binding and get to the global environment without finding a value associated with the variable, we're going to complain, saying it's unbound. Now remember, we're representing our environments as just lists of frames. So to get the initial environment, we'll take an empty environment, just the empty list, and extend it, building a single frame, in which we do the following. We take a set of possible names for built-in primitives and a set of procedures that are going to go with those and install them into the environment. If you look at the code on page 4 for our particular implementation, you'll see that we're going to rely on giving names to the built-in scheme primitives, things like car, could, or const, plus, greater than, times, and all those sorts of pieces. Of course, we could have established a name of our choice to those built-in primitives, and we could have selected whichever things we want to have as, as available to us as primitive elements. But the idea is to build a new frame in which we have bindings of names to our primitive procedures. Notice we'll also create bindings for true and false to the Boolean values star t and star f in this environment as well, using the defined variable form. And then we'll simply return that environment as our initial environment. If this is not certain to you, check out the code to see how we do it. It's pretty straightforward. To interact with our evaluator, we need some mechanism for getting expressions into it. And for this, we build a simple little driver loop. This is often known as an REP, or read eval print loop in which it runs through this constant cycle of reading in an expression, evaluating it using the interpreter, then printing out the result, and going back around and reading in the next expression. And indeed, if you look at this little piece of code, you can see that it runs through exactly that loop. It prints out some prompt on the screen to say, I'm ready, reads in an expression using schemes read uh, procedure, then interprets that using our evaluator, starting in the global environment, exactly where we expect it to be, it then tells us we're going to give you us an answer and prints out that answer and goes back around. Simple little loop that lets us read expressions, evaluate them with respect to the global environment, and print out the result. And with that, we've now built an evaluator. It has all of the pieces. It has the capability of dealing with eval and apply to underwrap the abstractions in order to get down to basic expressions. It has some syntax for telling us how to write legal expressions in that language, which is cleanly separated out from the semantics of eval and apply. And then it has very particular ways of implementing environments to store our bindings of values and variables, and a way to actually get input into and out of that evaluator. So there you have it. We've built an evaluator. We've actually built a full-blown scheme evaluator, eval and apply in all its grand glory. And while we've thrown a lot of code at you, you should be able to look at the pieces and see the higher level issues we've talked about here. Having done that, we can now step back and ask some questions about choices that were made in designing this evaluator. In particular, we've said much earlier in the term that Scheme, and the, therefore the evaluator we've just built, uses lexical scoping. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about what happens when we apply a procedure to a set of arguments. Again, if we look at it a little bit more carefully, it says we're going to get the values of the arguments and the value of the procedure itself, and then we're going to create a new environment in which the variables of the procedure, the parameters of the procedure, are bound to the arguments passed in, and relative to that environment, we're going to evaluate the body of the procedure. Okay, now what happens inside that body? In particular, that body will be an expression that contains lots of names. And the issue is, how do we find the values associated with those names? Well, first of all, we know any value that was a formal parameter of that procedure gets its value from the frame we just created. Those are called bound parameters. But any variable in that body that is not one of the formal parameters is known as a free variable. How do we find the bindings for those? And what we've said is that when we have a procedure that has free variables, the values that they get are taken to refer to the bindings made by enclosing procedure definitions. Or in other words, they're looked up in the environment in which the procedure was defined. Or said another way, it says we walk up that chain of environments looking for a binding of the variable. And we know that chain of environments comes from sets of procedures. So if our procedure is defined inside of a procedure, we know that if we can't find a scoping, a formal parameter, a binding for the particular thing we're looking for in the initial lambda, we go outside of that lambda to the next enclosing lambda, looking for that. Therefore, if you like, the boundaries of the lambda expressions define the chain of, of frames we're going to see in our environment, and that's how we're actually going to capture our lexical environment to determine bindings of variables. How does this happen in practice? Well, look at the code, and in particular, look at make procedure, which you'll find on page three of the handout. It glues together a tag or label, the actual parameters, the body, and the environment in which it's evaluated. 
And as a consequence, the evaluation environment is stored away and is always going to be the enclosing lexical scoop. It's going to tell us where to look to find a binding for a variable if we don't find it as a formal parameter of the actual procedure. Why? Well, that was just the choice we made for our semantic rules for procedure application. What did we say to do? Hang a new frame, bind the parameters to the actual arguments in that new frame, and evaluate the body in this new environment. That was our environment model, and we've made a choice that says we will scope together frames based on where the procedures were actually evaluated. So let's remind ourselves of how that works in our evaluator. This is just going back over the environment model, but we've now built a very particular implementation of that in our eval and apply. So let's define foo to be a procedure that has as a body another procedure. And of course, in the environment model, we know what happens. Evaluation of this expression will create a binding for foo in the global environment. That's where we're interacting with the read eval print loop. And that is bound to the procedure that we get with one argument, x and y, coming from that hidden lambda. Remember, the desugaring of the syntax will convert this into a defined foo of lambda of x, y, and then a body. Evaluation of the lambda creates that double bubble with an environment pointer back to the global environment, since that's where we evaluated the lambda, whose parameters are x and y, and whose body is itself another lambda. Remember again, we have not evaluated this lambda yet. Now, let's apply foo to a couple of arguments and give the result the name bar. Foo, of course, drops a new frame, or hangs it, if you like, scoped by the same place the procedure says to, namely up to the global environment. Inside of there, we bind the parameters x and y to the values 1 and 2. Notice in our implementation, that's done as two lists, the list of x, y, and the list 1, 2. And then relative to this frame, we evaluate the body. And the body of this procedure is another lambda, so we create it scoped by this frame, since that's where we did the evaluation. And bar is bound to the result of that whole thing, which is that particular procedure. So now let's go ahead and apply bar. Our environment model, and uh, as a consequence, our eval apply that we've built, basically says, get the value bar, which is a procedure, and apply it by dropping a frame whose enclosing environment is the same thing the procedure's enclosing environment was, relative to which we bind the parameter z to the input argument 3, and relative to which we evaluate plus xyz, or the body of that procedure. Notice, we are now evaluating xyz with respect to e2, which says we'll get the binding for z from this frame. It was scoped lexically by the procedure uh, itself, or the lambda, rather, itself. But to get the bindings for x and y, we will move up the chain to the next enclosing environment, which comes from the enclosing lambda buried inside of the foo. Notice as well, to get the value of plus, we move up from e2 through e1 up to the global environment to get its binding. That is the ultimate enclosing scope into which we can find a parameter binding. As a consequence, we can see that we will always evaluate the expression plus xyz, that body of that procedure, in a new environment inside the surrounding lexical environment. Every time we apply this procedure, we're going to hang a new frame that will always scope back to e1. E1 is therefore our surrounding lexical environment. We will always get the same bindings for x and y. Now, that was a particular choice we made, but it's not the only way to do evaluation. An alternative way to get bindings for free variables would be to look them up in the caller's environment, meaning in the environment that is corresponding to the procedure actually asking for them, rather than in the surrounding lexical environment, the one we just saw, which is inherited from when the procedure was created. This will lead to different behavior. This is known as dynamic scoping because it is based on the actual values in place when the caller asks for them. This model then leads to a different behavior. For example, we could define poo to be a procedure of one argument x whose body calls bear on 20. Notice no explicit reference to x here. We could define bear to be a procedure of one argument y which adds x to y. Notice there's no explicit parameter for x here, so bear needs to get it from somewhere else. But if we call poo on the value 9, it will then take bear applied to 20 and give it as well the value of x now passed in as 9 in order to get 29 out. This may look strange. Think about whether this would work under normal lexical scoping, under the evaluation we're, we're used to. And the answer, of course, would be no. But we're now changing the behavior. We're asking poo when it is used to get the value of x passed in, which is 9. And when we pass that on to bear, bear is then saying, use the value of x that is in place when I asked for it not the one that is inherited by the lexical scoping. Suppose we want to change our evaluator to use dynamic scoping rather than lexical scoping. What would it do, first of all, conceptually to the environment model? Well, here's our sequence of things we want to evaluate. The first thing to notice is when we define poo to be a procedure of one argument x, notice we don't need the double bubble anymore. That second part of the bubble was around to tell us what was the enclosing environment in which the lambda was evaluated. But now we don't need that because we're not going to pass that down. 
So defining Poo will simply create a procedure that has a single argument x and a body, and that's all we need to use to represent it. Similarly, defining bare will give us a procedure of one argument y whose body is the list x, y, but no enclosing environment pointer. It's no longer necessary under this way of thinking about things. Now let's apply poo to some argument. Applying poo under this new model says drop a frame in which we bind the formal parameter x to the value 9 passed in, and that frame gets scoped by the caller's environment, which in this case happens to be the global environment. That's where we're asking for things. It looks much like before. Now, Relative to that frame, we're going to evaluate the body of Poo. And the body of Poo says apply bear to y. So in this case, we're going to apply a procedure. We're going to build a frame where by y is bound to 20 as before. But now, the scoping environment is given to point towards the environment that was in place when the caller was asked. Or in other words, it points to E1. It does not inherit the environment that was there when bear was actually created, but rather it points to who asked for it. And in this case, we can then evaluate the body plus x, y. Therefore, looking up the value of y passed in as an argument to bear and inheriting the value of x that was passed in when we evaluated poo. The key thing to note is that we will evaluate the expression plus x, y in an environment that extends the caller's environment, which means if we call this a different time, we will have a different environment. And that's very different than the lexical case in which this would always point back to the environment that was created when the procedure itself was created. So we can see we can get a very different behavior, which will have some advantages and some disadvantages compared to normal lexical scoping. We'll come back later to the issues of why one would like to have dynamic binding rather than lexical binding. This just gives different performance in terms of what the language does. The key issue we want to show here, though, is how simple it is to make that change. And in particular, we make a very small number of changes to our evaluator. The first one is, when we evaluate a lambda, we're going to make a procedure as before, but now we don't need to include the enclosing environment. As you saw, we don't make a double bubble, we make a single bubble. So when we make a procedure, we simply pass in a symbol that says there is no environment here. The second change occurs when we go about actually applying a procedure, something we built with a lambda to a set of arguments. Remember in the previous case what we did. We got the value of the operator, we got the value of the operands as a list, and then we applied them. An application there meant that we would evaluate the body of the procedure in a new environment, extending the environment part of the procedure with a frame that had bindings for parameters to arguments. Here we don't do that. Here our application says, get the value of the operator, get the list of values of the operands, and then apply that operator to those values in the current environment. We've added one more argument to our apply. And the only other change we need to do is to build a dynamic apply rather than our standard metacircular apply. Here apply takes in a procedure, a list of arguments, and an environment, the environment that the caller is coming from. What does it do? If it's a primitive, it does it just like before. If it's a compound procedure, that is an application of something we built with a lambda, we will, as before, evaluate the body, which we expect to be a sequence, in an environment. But here the environment comes from extending the uh, calling environment rather than the procedure's environment itself. Remember, under dynamic scoping, the procedure doesn't keep track of the environment in which it was created. But rather, when we want to extend something, we extend the environment that was in place when we asked for this value. The key thing we want you to see here is an incredibly small number of changes to eval and apply dramatically change the way in which variables are looked up. This goes from lexical scoping to dynamic scoping with two or three very simple changes. In some sense, this was the whole point of this little example of dynamic scoping. It leads to a different kind of behavior. It's worth thinking about what advantages one gets by having that way of looking things up. But notice what we've really done. By making a few small changes to eval and apply, we've changed the semantics of the language. That's exactly the point of having an eval and apply. By creating those, we're defining what it means to evaluate expressions in a language. Notice the second point. By cleanly separating out the syntax from the semantics, we've enabled that kind of change very easily. By putting in the data abstractions, the syntax, the legal way of writing expressions in our language, is left separate from the actual way in which they're interpreted. And here we can actually change the rules for interpretation without having to change the syntax. We're going to come back to this idea of having different ways of evaluating things and looking at the implications of those changes in terms of the behavior of the language in the next lecture.